Hi there. Today I've got something exciting to share with you around some issues that I've had with my ThingWorks environment, specifically um, error messages that are erroneous and fill up the log files. So today we're going to talk about ThingWorks logging configuration tuning and filtering. So without further ado, let's have a look at my situation here. I have um, some log messages that are shown here. You can see I've got a ton of these error messages coming from this authenticator. This is an authenticator plugin that we use to essentially authenticate via, via LDAP, some web service, back to our corporate directory. And it's got a little bit of an issue in that if, if there's somebody that tries to authenticate that doesn't use this authenticator, it throws an error, but this is perfectly normal. Um, we can probably see here, these are my Prometheus users. So it's normal that the Prometheus user isn't going to be authenticated back uh, and this happens uh, continuously because it's, we're talking about Prometheus. We're also talking about load testing. So if I do have any non-corporate um, user that I want to be doing some load testing with, uh, anytime I hit the platform with that particular user to do an authentication, it's going to try and route it through this authenticator and we're going to get a bunch of these messages coming up. So it's a real pain. Um, and specifically, as, you, as you're likely aware, I do a lot of load testing. And, um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of um, service requests to ThingWorks are going to equate to a ton of errors like this that fill up my logs, um, specifically the error logs, and um, not only take up space on disk, I've had to purge out uh, more than 12 gigabytes of logs. I recently did another video on um, some aspects of log configuration for a production environment not to get into that situation but one of the outstanding ones was really this one and i wanted to specifically hone in on this particular message because it's a real pain and, and as i say it's it's completely false so uh, if we just have a quick look at at this message um i actually just emptied out the logs yesterday but you can see that just in the course of today, we've already got about 8,000 of these messages coming up. Uh, and I haven't been doing any lo load testing. So, you know, this will quickly be hundreds of thousands of messages had I been doing some load testing. So if I kind of come over to, to um, the internet over here and just let's look at a kind of a starting point, how to configure ThingWorks logging help centers platform help I touched on this in the last video around log configuration but if we search for logback in the help center we're going to get to one of these options here configuring logging and the configuring logging page in here tells us about uh, taking the default internal logback xml file from the thingworks war file it tells us where we can find it we have to extract the war file go dig it out of there and, and essentially take that and put it into our ThingWorks platform folder so that we can then go and, and make some changes. Once we make some changes to that, that's going to override the, the defaults that are within the WAR file. And um, that's what we're going to look at here is some of the logback specific customizations or configurations that we can do. I'm, you know, logback is super, super powerful. So, you know, this I set up in about a half an hour, um, but definitely do some research on logback if this is something that you need to get into because there's there's a ton of stuff that you can do, including making your own set of appenders, your own sets of rules, filters, etc. cetera. Um, so th this is what we're starting with. If we kind of come back to um, my system over here, Let's have a look at that logback XML. So we've already got this open, and you can see this is the this is mostly the, the default configuration file. Previously, I talked about some of the other things in here on the zip mechanisms that are up at the top here on how the archiving is done and how you can change naming structures. Um, but if we come down here near to the bottom, um, I'm going to talk first about this, which is one approach that we can use here to do some tuning on the log configurations. Um, here I've just specified a different logger name and I'm calling specifically out the class um, that that is in a problem. And this I've gotten from, I had to kind of extract the, um, uh, the war file and go in to come up with all the names of all the specific um, 
the class here to find out what this is in the logs. It just says CTSA Authenticator. Um, but once I found that, what I've done here is I've specified the level as to off, um, and then I'm calling this to refer to the particular appender. Technically speaking, I should actually also put the one for the error. Here I have appender ref uh, up here because this is coming up in both places, right? The, the application log as well as the error log. I uh, didn't have a look at those file sizes, but um, I'm not sure if I can actually do both of those in there, but that's essentially what I would want to do here, right? So I want to say for this particular class, I want to set a custom level. We can obviously kind of dig into that and set different custom levels for different things. Um, I'm turning it off here, but typically you'd go in the other direction, right? It's to say turn it up for a particular thing. You might want to turn down overall settings um, Generally speaking, you know, if I use an example, let's say we start with some, you know, higher level debug information or even info. If we're doing some testing, you can find the the class that you're looking for, the error message that you're looking for with uh, more verbose logging. Write it down, and then we can come back in here and turn everything else down, and then just call out the specifics of the uh, entities that you want to work with. So. I'm turning it down here for one thing, but you can think about using this in the opposite direction, right? Where we actually turn it up for certain things. Um, okay, back to the screen sharing. So here I'm actually not really using this setting. Uh, we want to go up to the, the next bit, which is something that I just kind of found. I did a search for, I tried none and it didn't work. So I did a search for um, log back level types and if you do that you know you can log back log levels um, and you can see you'll you'll fall on to a number of things um, this is the one I actually fell upon the first time I did it but you know you can see here there's different guides to log back different messages trace debug info warn there's a bunch of different places do some research but specifically, I want to talk about this page because find, falling into the Stackify site, um, you know, it's quite comprehensive here. We're not talking about just documentation for logback. They're talking about how you can use and configure logback to solve specific problems, which is very interesting. Um, can't really say I read it all, but, you know, as we kind of come into it, there's a number of different things, the configuration files. And specifically, the one that um, I'm going to call out is the filtering mechanism that I found. Um, as I say, tons of stuff in here, very useful. I will post this in the description. And the one I want to call out, if I can find it, I think we're close. Filtering. There we go. So filtering logs. Um, there's a number of different ways that we can filter um, here in Logback, and you can see this is just a classic level-based filter where we can kind of say if it's error, accept, deny. It's a different mechanism, right, than what we were doing before. Before we were setting um, the log level for particular for a particular class. Here we're actually filtering based on a particular class. So I could have used something like this to filter out the specific errors for that class, um, the errors in general for that class. But if we kind of come down a little bit further, we have this evaluator filter. And this evaluator filter, this is obviously going to use more resources, CPU and evaluations, but it allows us to be able to evaluate a specific expression. So here we're checking the log level. Um, we're also looking if the message in the, the log contains a particular string here. And we're going to essentially accept or deny this as a log message in there. So I've taken this and I've composed it a little bit to essentially get us to a point where uh, right here. So you can see here, evaluator filter, Boolean expression, anything above warn. And uh, if the logger, so the class contains this string, um, I just want to make it as specific as possible before getting you know, too generic, because then my message, I'm using a generic message that's showing up in all of those lines, which is PTC account. Um, and basically, I'm just denying them log message. 
I've put this in here in the appender application. I've also put it into the appender error, right, because it's coming up in both of those files. And I have to say, pretty pretty amazing. I don't have any of these messages coming up. Success, successfully been able to filter out these specific error level error messages for the PTC account uh, authenticator. Uh, and that means now that I've done this this way, I can remove that that one where I'm turning off logging altogether for all of the authenticators, which isn't really great. It's a little bit, um, it's not as specific as I wanted. And, you know, you can think about applying this, this accept and deny, just to invert the two, depending on the type of testing or use case that you have, where you can either, if you're looking for a particular message, you can call it out. Uh, or if you're looking for a particular message, like you're doing some testing and you've got your logs, they're completely flooded, you're unable to see what's going on, you can use this approach to, um, to call out the messages that you want to just get rid of. Obviously, you can use things like grep and whatnot, but uh, keep in mind, before we write it to disk, uh, we're going to save the, the I.O. resources by not writing it if we filter it out while we're running in memory. Uh, and I guess to finish off, just another thing that, uh, that jumped out in that article that I want to call attention to here is this little setting at the bottom. And um, this is kind of cool because, you know, I mentioned load testing. One of the things in load testing or, or like this area that we're just talking about now that comes up is sometimes you'll just have the same messages coming up over and over and over again. And when something breaks, then, you know, database disconnection, for example, or DNS unable to resolve something, you know it's going to continue to be broken, right? It's not going to just all of a sudden stop. So while something isn't working, um, it can be good to know that it's still not working, but it can also just continue to completely flood your logs. And in a production environment, that might not be what you want. And certainly, you know, it can fill up a disk. It also uses a lot of resources. So here I've applied this duplicate message filter. And this is in the turbo filter category so it's going to be a lot faster than that other evaluation mechanism but basically it's just looking for four repeated messages uh, so we'll only ever have five messages and this applies across all the the configurations we'll only have five um, consecutive messages of any particular type and you know there is a there is a use case where we've seen this recently where if you didn't have the permissions set appropriately on a persistence provider like the user that was um, set to an app key for Kepware or something like this that was writing data into a value stream, if they didn't have appropriate access onto the persistence provider, um, it would go into the value stream, but the persistence provider might not have been able to write that property. And you would have gotten, in that case, there's an error message that came up in trace mode uh, only. But, you know, if you did get that message, you could have hundreds and thousands of that message very quickly because it would be for all rights for that persistence provider. So this is a nice little nice little tweak, I thought. Obviously, I put a comment in here, not so great for debugging. If you, if you have five or six or 10 or 100, you might want to know that. Or if you have a log management system like uh, Elasticsearch or something that's looking at it, you might want to know how many actual log messages that you have and not have such a filter in place, but uh, something valuable to check out. Okay, well, I hope you found that useful. Uh, as I say, this has been something that's been plaguing me for years, so I'm, I'm quite pleased to have uh, finally taken a little bit of time to set something up and um, get it sorted out. My logs are going to be much cleaner. Have a great day.